some people coming. So good evening everybody. It's my pleasure and my honor to introduce uh, Idan Segev. Uh, Idan is coming from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and uh, he's the director of the Life Science Institute and of the Center of Neurocomputation in Jerusalem. But what is uh, uh, I think even more important, he's a great scientist and he's a colleague and we have been in contact and in uh, strong connections for many years with him and with uh, his partners in Jerusalem. I spent in his institute uh, more than one month, a couple of years ago, and I think that was an incredible experience and I'm really happy that uh, uh, Idan could, could make it and come here to visit us. Um, something about his uh, scientific uh, activity and uh, I mean is really uh, very interesting in uh, many senses. He studied uh, mathematics and then he got a PhD in mathematics and bio, um, bio biosciences I would say. Uh, and then he had the opportunity to work with uh, one person who has written an important chapter in the history of science, is uh, Wilfried Rau. For everybody of you who studied physiology and the physiology of the nervous system of neurons, Wilfried Rau remains a milestone because he's the founder of the theory of the cable, the cable theory that is applied to neurons, but all the elongated fibers of uh, the body, including the muscle fibers. And this theory is a mathematical theory. It is something like the crank theory for diffusion equations. It's a theory in which uh, differential uh, equations are used to explain how a complex structure works and processes currents and potentials. And this theory is the foundation for what came after, which means the biophysics of neurons, the fine investigation of the physics of the neurons, and the modeling of the neurons. And again, Idan is one of the pioneers of this neural modeling in terms of fine bottom-up, as we call it, or data-driven, as others call it, uh, modeling of the neurons. Mm -hmm. Which means that these neurons are investigated in detail in terms of their biological and biochemical properties, which are then translated in mathematical forms and then transformed into models that can be simulated. He will tell about the story that is really fascinating. Another point that is very interesting is that recently, I mean, that's what I learned from his, uh, um, from, uh, his uh, words, he got very much interested in uh, higher brain functions and also in uh, the connection between science and the neuroscience and the brain and art. Because this brings him back to the story of his uh, family where the, um, uh, the mother and the father were more related to art than to science. 
And it was really nice for me to, to know and to understand because it tends to put together many aspects of the life of a scientist. We are not only a reason, we are only something else. So we tended to put in our work, in our uh, uh, activity, also the emotions that come from our background. Um, I think that uh, um, uh, Idan will tell much more about this in his talk. But before that, I would like to read the motivation for the prize that we decided to give him this year. The prize is a great initiative that was launched by the Collegio Borromeo. It's a, a prize in honor of Cesare Casella. Cesare Casella was a physiologist, and he is one of those who promoted physiology in Italy uh, around half of the last century. And he promoted the development of the most important preparations used in physiology nowadays, and that dominated physiology for several decades. And from him, most of the important schools of physiology of Italy descended, including the school of Pavia, that then divided into several branches, and now there are several laboratories doing different things and exploring different aspects of physiology, following what Cesare Casella is, uh, instructed and initiated many years ago. Uh, Cesare Casella was also one of the uh, most important representatives of this college. He also had important roles in this college. And in honor of him, this prize has been uh, uh, instituted three years ago. This is the third of the prizes awarded in the honor of Cesare Casella. Um, now I read the motivation for Idan. For the Casella Prize 2019, awarded to Idan Segev. The Casella Prize 2019 is awarded to Professor Idan Segev for his outstanding scientific activity in the neuroscience with specific regard to brain modeling. Especially relevant are the results published in the top-ranked international journals on the biophysical and mathematical structure of neurons and microcircuit functions of the cerebral cortex in mice and humans. These results open important scenarios for future neuroscientific studies and suggest potential applications in the biomedical sector. So, my best compliments to Idan. So please, Idan, now let's go with your talk. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's a special occasion, very special, to stand here and understanding that this is maybe 900 years of, of history, of uh, science. I'm coming from a very new country, you know, 71 years old, we just celebrated, uh, with a lot of previous culture of Judaism, of learning. But this is something very special for me, and I even got here a king room that is amazing. <laughs> so I'm going to enjoy, I hope you will enjoy with me tonight both the lecture and also the, the special event, something very unique. I don't get prizes every day, I got several, but this is very special, and thank you very much, and Gideo, and Director, and, and all of you for coming. Uh, I have a very special task today because I want to really explain to you something about the history of my own learning, especially in the last several years, from doing modeling. But a note from Simona, who took very good care of me, she, here she is, uh, a, a brief history, a brief summary of, uh, of uh, uh, Chazella life, and, and, and I found this little sentence which connected me immediately to his work here in Pavia, uh, and this is the, the issue of the digital electronic calculator. Apparently, he was the first to bring here uh, to Pavia, I should say, Pavia, uh, this digital electronic calculator, this PDP-8, which was also my own first computer to do some calculations. And, and you can notice that this was a huge amount of memory, 4K memory. You understand that this computer has several gigabytes. And this, this was the first, not so long ago, actually, if you think about it, not so long ago. You can see the amazing uh, progress. 
So this little sentence that was among the longer uh, life of, of, uh, of uh, Cesarea was really for me a connecting point, because in some sense he brought calculations to Pavia, to the scientific world. So let me start my talk by this uh, maybe unexpected beginning. I want to tell you the story of this girl, 11 years old, Abby, who was my reviewer for a paper that I wrote under this journal. I will end also by speaking about this special journal. It's called Frontiers for Young Minds, which I highly recommend you to look at. Not only to look at, but also to contribute the paper. The idea of this new journal, relatively new journal, is that scientists significant, important scientists, including recently a Nobel Prize from Israel, contribute a chapter to a child, to kids, so the kids could learn what we do, be prepared for the changing world. And I wrote, together with Feli Schumacher, who is a member of the Blue Brain, the Blue Brain Project, which I will talk about, we wrote a paper trying to explain what do we do in the Human Brain Project, especially what do we do in terms of modeling the brain. And this 11 years old girl, you know, we are not allowed to show the real face, so she's anonymous, you know that she's in New York, her name is Abby, she rejected my paper twice. <laughs> she said, Professor Fusegev, with all respect, I don't understand why do you need to model something that already exists? <laughs> and also, I don't understand what does it mean to model something. I don't understand the term modeling which was extremely good rejection. You understand that when a kid rejects you, it's because she or he want to understand. When a scientist rejects you, maybe it's because of ego issues. But here it's really the need to understand. In this case, she really didn't understand what does it mean to model. And, and how do you physically transform a biological phenomenon to a mathematical equation? It's not obvious at all. To some of you it is obvious, but when I talk to people in the street, or when I give a public lecture, which I give a lot, people do not understand what does it mean to model a system. So I want to show you through these eyes of the girl, how I see this process of modeling, and what did I learn from modeling the brain. Of course, not from the very beginning, which is 40 years, but only in the last few years, what did I learn, especially from the Blue Brain Project, which I'm part of, the Human Brain Project, Blue Brain Project. So, so, I really want to go through this process of, of this talk. I want to really give a little bit background of, of connectivity or connections structure in the brain. I want then really to show you a paper that was recently published in Nature Neuroscience, our paper on looking for the structure of cortical circuits using mathematical graph theory approach. I want then to show you a very recent, we just submitted now to Nature, a recent paper that we just uh, completed to show you that you are born with specific local structure. You cannot escape from being born with particular structure. Your cortex is not random. I want to show you why it is not random. This was a revelation for me. I didn't realize until we did this work uh, that, that there is some innate, something that you are born with. You cannot escape from this innate structure. This innate structure may have a functional meaning, which we should discuss. Then I want to show you some practical use of building a model. I will show you, and if you ask me what does it mean to understand the brain, eventually I will tell you it means that you need to build the brain. If I succeed to build the brain from first principles and this brain comes to Pavia to lecture it instead of me, then I understood the brain. So my brain was built by evolution, but I don't understand it. If I could build the brain from first principles, and I want to show you that we can, by building a brain, we can understand aspects that we could not understand if we wouldn't build it one by one, synapse by synapse, nerve by neuron by neuron. I want to show you some practical use of building the brain. And if I have time, I don't know how, how much patience you have, and I want you also to ask questions, so it should be semi-informal. If you think uh, that you want to ask questions, please, please stop in the middle, I want you to understand. Otherwise, it would be a model. Spend here an hour and talk. But if we should have time, I want to show where we are going. My lab and I think other labs, what, what is the future in this direction of brain modeling? So, this is the plan. So, let's start with the background of connectivity. You know that there are, of course, many methods to, to look at the connections in the brain at different levels. This is one example the macro connectomics, so, this is fibers 
course, not with the colors in the brain, but you know, with the Photoshop color showing the connection between one region to another region in the mouse and in the chimpanzee and in the human. So you can look at the connector, it's called uh, using, using the fibers that connect one region to another. Of course, you don't know the direction, whether it starts here or ends here or starts here or ends here, but this is the connectivity, gross connectivity of your brain, if you look at this. By the way, interestingly, if you look at this, this MRI connector versus the in human versus chimpanzee and mouse, you see how intense the connector in our brain is, how much we are connected from one region to another. This white matter connectomics is very, very intense in the human brain versus other brains. And personally, I think that this connectomics, these heavy connections between the visual cortex and the auditory cortex and motor cortex and so on, is, is a part of the origin of creativity or the capability to generate language, but we can talk about this later. But, but this is a very popular thing to do today because it is easy to use the tensor, the, this technique of diffusion tensor imaging to do this connector, and then you can analyze it using graph theory, for example. So many people are now using this connector information, who is connected to who, to try to see what kind of graphs, connected graphs you have in your brain. And I'm not going to go on to, to, to these techniques, you know, but it's clear that you can already see that our brain gross connector is not random. There are regions that are highly connected to other regions, and some regions are less connected to other regions. It's not a random connector that everybody could in principle be connected. You are born with some connections, and this of course has some meanings of information transfer from here to here if you have a lot of connections, and not from here to here if you don't have connections, and so on. But this is also being used to really detect diseases. So you can look at the brain of, let's say, schizophrenia uh, patients, or uh, Alzheimer patients, or, or dyslectic, and so on, and you can see that there is something about this graph, these connected nodes, is not as in the regular brain. You can really make distinction just by looking at the connector and to show some correlation between a specific disease, let's say schizophrenia, and a regular average brain of non schizophrenia This is very popular, and there is the whole, actually there is a new journal just established in MIT, the connectome, the connectome, or the, the science, it's called Net Science Network, Network Science. It's a new science because you can do network of, let's say, Facebook network, you know, friendship networks, you can do networks of planes flying back and forth, what is the connections, so I came from Jerusalem, from Israel, with the EasyJet. It's one connection from Jerusalem, from Tel Aviv here. So you can use the, the graph theory as it is being done both to, the, to, to, to social media and to the brain connector. And this is a very popular, there are many, many works uh, done on this, at this level of connector. But there are very, very few works being done on this level of connection. So if you look at a very small piece of your cortex, or a mouse cortex, you see this huge jungle of many, many cells sitting one near the other in a very, very dense uh, connectomics, as it is called. So I distinguish between connectome, which is the gross connection, and the local connections in a cubic millimeter, let's say. Uh, you, you see a whole jungle. We should talk about this jungle, and we should try to make order in this jungle. Or try to make sense using graph theory in this jungle. But there is this jungle, it's a beautiful jungle, and in the blue brain we build the jungle, really physically build the jungle with the computer to try to understand the structure of this jungle. Is it random jungle? Could everybody be connected to everybody randomly, or there are some structures that you are born with? As you are born in connections between regions, are you also born with connections within local circle? So that's the first question that I want to raise in this talk. Okay, so I have a student, a young girl, who likes to play with wires. His wife and he built, you know, just taking these sewing wires, putting it like this, and asking, so this is one set, this is another set, are they all connected randomly, or is there a structure? I myself was inspired, as uh, Jidio just said, I like art, and I highly recommend the art of this particular artist, uh, Jackson Pollock who you may know because he was the first to generate what is called the action painting, that you run on the canvas and you 
spritz, you know, your colors again and again, and you get something like this, which now costs, you know, many, many tens of millions of dollars, the chance of polo. And you ask yourself, mathematically, is it random or not? This drawing. Is it completely random, or is there a structure inside? So I highly recommend the recent paper in a volume that I published, and Gideon just mentioned it, that, that there is a whole volume that uh, I co-edited with other two colleagues. It's called Brain and Art. It's 37 papers on brain and art in the connection between brain and art. And there is a group of mathematicians who analyzed this particular painter and showing that it's highly non-random. Because you know when you do something like this, you are activated by your brain activity. It's not random, you do something very regular, and so the canvas reflects this regularity. It's not a random painting. Although it looks completely square, it's not square. Anyway, I'm not going to go into it. I just want to say that you can look at something that looks random. If you analyze it correctly, as we shall do in the cortex soon, you can find structure within the, what seems to be completely nonsense, random. Everything can happen. Not everything can happen. In this case, because it is a brain, and the brain is not a random structure, so you, you impose the brain on the canvas, and it becomes nonsense and random. Anyway, this is an interesting uh, article. And if, if you are interested, just, just log in and write Brain and Art, Frontiers Brain and Art, it's in the Frontiers paper journal, you will find a paper on Jason Pollock and non -randomness. But let's go to the cortex. So the first paper that came uh, about uh, 10 years ago, I think now, by this group, 2005, actually 14 years ago, was the first paper that really tried to record in a slice of the cortex from multiple cells. So you have an electrode in cell number one, number two, number three, and number four, and you ask yourself, what about connectivity between these four cells? Because you can stimulate this one cell and, and generate an action potential, we call the synaptic potential, if they are connected synaptically, then you can really have a, 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 a description of the local connectivity between these four cells. And when you have enough of these four cells again and again and again and again, if you have enough statistics of many, many four cells like this in the, in the cortex, in this case of the mouse, you can see something in the experiments. You can see something that is, is, is impressive. You can see that cer certain triplets, triplets of cells, cell A, cell B, and cell C, are connected much more than expected in a random network. So when I say random network, I mean take three people and randomly say, I have a probability to connect to Egidio, a probability to connect to Simona, some probability, let's say 0.2, but random. This is what would happen, this is the reference line here, but you can see that some triplets, triplet number 16, triplet number 10, I don't know if you can see the arrows. This is, there is an arrow between here to here, an arrow between here to here, and an arrow between here to here. So let's say triplet number 10 is highly more than expected by random. This is at least in the cortex when we call it many, 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 many four like this. Okay, this was an interesting result. And actually, the name of this paper is here, highly non-random features of synaptic connectivity in local cortical circuits. This was the first paper published in Nature Neuroscience some 14 years ago. I saw this paper, it was interesting, that it's not random, but it did invoke in me at least the need to understand more. Later on, in 2011, uh, here, there was a work by Marco, Henry Marco, you may have heard of him, Gideon and myself. Other, he was the one to initiate the Human Brain Project, and he's the head of the Blue Brain Project in Geneva and Lausanne today. He had a very talented, still today, Brazilian fellow who could record simultaneously from 12 cells, not four, but 12 at the same time. So these are the 12 pyramidal cells, one, two, three, four, five, 12 cells, or 11 cells, and he can now have a much better statistic of connectivity. And, and you can see, not here, but I can tell you that surprisingly the same overexpressed 
or underexpressed motifs that were found in the cortex of the mouse are also found in the cortex of the rat in this case. This was so, the other one was visual cortex, this is somatosensory cortex, but it's the same overexpression and underexpression of motifs. Again, the same non-randomness in both series. This is something to be interesting because it looks general, it's not one case, one example. But the most interesting thing for me as a theoretician came when I, I saw this, this next thing, and which is this, this in silico, and that's what I want to discuss today, the in silico building of a circuit. So this is an example from a group in, uh, in Germany, Oberland, Marcel Oberlander and Bert Sackmann from 19, uh, 2014, started to build in the computer a cortical circuit by putting cells, as I will explain in a second, putting cells in a volume, deciding, let's say, on a cubic millimeter, and you put in the, in the, in the model, you put cell after cell after cell after cell, 100,000 cells in a cubic millimeter, so you should remember, this is a magic number, in one cubic millimeter of a mouse brain, or a rat brain, you will have about 100,000 cells. In, in a cubic millimeter, is like a pin head, it's a very small thing, 100,000 cells in a cubic millimeter, about 40 million synopses. And when you analyze this structure that they build, you again get the same overexpression and underexpression of motifs as in the cortex. Although this was artificially big. The same overexpression motifs, underexpression motifs, strip motif. This motif is overexpressed, this motif is underexpressed. And then there was the blue brain. So we built, and I will tell you a few words about building the blue brain, which is again taking cells, looking at the column, this is your skull or the mouse skull, the red skull, this is two millimeter deep, there are six layers, you start to put this cell, this cell, this cell, this cell, this cell, this cell, with the correct quantity, with correct type of cells, you pack them together and you have a rule for connectivity. So if an axon comes close enough to a dendrite, it's a putative synapse. It's a, it's a random decision when a cell, when an axon comes to near the right, maybe it's a synapse. When you analyze this, you get the same overexpression and underexpression of the motifs that they show you. So this must be a general issue, and we are now we, are, we need to understand what, what's going on. Why when you put things and you seem to put them randomly, there is an emergence of a structure that is not random. This is something you need to understand. So just before I, I, I am trying to explain to you what happened, when, what did I learn, this was the name of my, my lecture, what did I learn by building or by modeling the brain, uh, I, I, will, I will talk about this, but I just want to say a word for you who don't know what does it mean to build a circuit physically in the computer, what does it mean to build a circuit. So for example, if you want to build a cortical circuit, you need to know who are the players, who are the cells that exist there. These are the morphological cells, the morphological types, that exist in, your, in the cortex of the mouse. This is layer one. In layer one you have only inhibitory cells, six types of inhibitory cells in terms of morphology. Layer two, three have mostly inhibitory cells, but only one excitatory cell type, not number, type. And so on, for different layers. You see that there are much more inhibitory cells in your cortex, in the cortex of the mouse, in terms of types, but this is only 10% of the total number. So most of the cells in the cortex are excitatory, but in terms of types, in terms of morphology, there are much less morphological types in the, in, in, of excitatory cells relative to inhibitory cells. And of course, we don't understand why. Why the 10% of your cells in the cortex are so diverse in morphology, and the 90% of the cells are less diverse than excitatory ones? We don't understand this, but this is a fact. And when you know the numbers and the density of this type, of this type, of this type, of this type, you can start to put them together and build the column. So this is the process of building a column. You take a cell type, another cell type, another cell type. You multiply them because you don't have, you have 100,000, you need to have 100,000 cells. Nobody reconstructed 100,000 of cells. So you take a cell type and you know that I need, let's say, 2,000 of this type. You build 2,000 of this type, 1,000 of this type, and so on. And eventually you put it in a volume, you start to pack them together, and then you start to connect them, and 
then you start to put an electrical activity of this type and of this type because there are different electrical profiles of different cells and eventually and you connect them by synaptic dynamics some synapses depressing some synapses facilitating and eventually you have a color a, 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 a computer model of a color it has an anatomy it has physiology synaptic physiology firing activity it should be a replica a good replica hopefully we don't know for sure because this is just a draft because we, we did a lot of assumptions along the way but this is a draft and that's how you build you pack things together you have a circuit and you hope and I will show you what did I learn by having such a circuit why do you this is the girl asking me why do you do why do you put everything together it's already there together why do you put it in the computer okay so I, I just want to say two two comments on this process of building because you really learn a lot when you build things in the computer or if you want to build it physically you can also build a, a, a brain there physically but here it's a digital it's a digital building so so two things i want to say for you that, to, to, that i think will be interesting so if you pack a lot of cells together really put them together a lot of them together like in a jungle but very very close to each other and you have a rule for connection which i mentioned an axon should come close enough to a dendrite without it, there is no synapse. There cannot be synapse if the axon is here and the dendrite is there. It should come very close. One micrometer close is the distance where you can have a spine touching between axon and dendrite. If you count how many possible connections you have in such a circuit, it's about 100 times more possible connections than actually you have there synapses. That means that Potentially, you have much more possibilities for connections than actually implemented when you, when you really build the brain. So in a cubic millimeter, there are 40 million synapses, but there could be 400 million synapses just by distances between answer and that one. Okay, so that's one interesting aspect. The other interesting thing that you might know, and this is unique to the Blue Brain Project, we know something that we don't completely know how it is established, but if a cell, let's say this cell makes a connection with the in between, between this cell and this cell, there is a synapse, there is always more than one. Always. So if I make a connection with the GPO, I will make five connections with it, or nothing. But I will not make one synapse. That's in our portals. It's an interesting phenomenon. Just to make sure that I'm connected to a GPO or not. I'm not weakly connected, I'm strongly connected or not. So we had to have an algorithm makes a, a, an on average five synapses between two pyramidal cells. We know that inhibitory cells to excitatory cells have even more synapses if they are connected. But anyway, this process of connection tells us that there are much more possibility of connections, which is part of plasticity. So I can give up this synapse and make a synapse with somebody very near, which I was already there. It was already very close. I don't need to build something in order to connect to the rector or to, or to Simone, I'm already there, it's already close to me. I just need to give up this because I don't need more and more synapses. Overall, I have 40 million synapses, not more, whatever it is. Anyway, so this circuit already tells me something about the rules for connectivity, but I don't want to go into it. Of course, one, one, one challenge is that when you build something, you want to make sure that it's close to reality. Of course, I took some principles from reality to build it, but then I want to, to do independent, independent uh, results that will show that my circuit is not far from reality. I don't want to go into it. By the way, I suggest to it, I don't know, I think we didn't discuss it with the GPO, but I think it would be good if I can put my lecture somewhere that you can download, then you can really remember if you want to, or take some. Actually, the, 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 I, I should say that the, the, the quality of the picture is higher than you see on the screen. Uh, and, and really high, so these are very beautiful, uh, much more nicer than my computer, so we need HDMI to solve the problem. So anyway, I don't want to go into it, but when you build it from some certain principles, you want also to generalize to other things that you do not measure in your circuit and show that your circuit really applies to things that were measured independently, that they were not as part of the building of the model. Anyway, so there is the validation process not only build, but you validate against other results. I don't want to show that. 
Okay, so now comes the question that I want to discuss, and the question is, is there a structure in this circuit that I build? Is there intrinsic structure that you cannot avoid when you build such a thing, or is it random? This is what I started to talk about. And the first thing that we found is that you have what is called the hubs. You must have heard this name, hub, computer hub. But in this case, we have hub neurons. So I want to explain what does it mean, hub. So let's say that this is a neuron. I'm a neuron. And on average, let's say, the circuit receives on average, let's say, on average, let's say, 300 synapses or 400 connections on average, there are certain cells in the circuit that get much more input than the average. You can call it in-hub. Cells that receive input more than, the, much more than the average. These are these cells. There are also out-hubs. Cells that sense more connections, make more connections, much more connections to others than on average. This is the out -hubs. Because if it was, if, it, if this is what is called long tail distribution, and these are the hub neurons, out hub and in hub, and in the circuits there are specific neurons that either send a lot of synapses or receive a lot of synapses, much more than in a random network. Who are these hubs? Now, because we build it, we can ask who are the hubs in the circuit? Those cells that are very, very, get a lot of synapses or send a lot of synapses, and you can say that this is layer 4 pyramidal cell, layer 5 pyramidals, and so on. These are the in-hub, these are the out-hubs. Now that you have a circuit that you build, you can analyze who are the hubs. You must understand that in the computer world, the hubs, a computer hub is very important because it receives a lot of information from other computers. It may send a lot of information to other computers. And if you destroy the hub, if you kill the hub, you destroy the whole circuit. So hubs are very important, also for diseases. So this is a prediction. If you have a disease that attacks this particular cell type, it will destroy the hub and it will dissolve the network, destroy the network. So this is a prediction of the model. We will discuss uh, if we can predict this prediction can and today with optogenetics you can analyze what is the effect of killing this particular cell type or this particular cell type from this. Anyway, so we can see that the in-hubs are mostly excitatory from deeper layer, the out-hub neurons are excitatory Martinotti cells, there is a small overlap between the cell that receives the synapses and the cell that sends the synapses, the synapses, these are not the same cell. And this is easy to explain. All of you could say immediately that the in-hub should be the cells with long dendrites. If I have long dendrites, I have a probability to get many synapses. And if I have long axons, I have a probability to make a lot of synapses with others. So the in hubs in the model, the in hubs are those with long dendrites, and the out hubs are cells with long axons. Okay, so this is, these are interesting results. There is another interesting result here that we found and still do not understand, although we build the model, so we should understand everything, because I build it, not the biology, but I build it. There is what is called the rich club. I don't know if you know this term, you know, rich people like each other. So if I'm rich, I have a rich friend. It's called the rich club. Apparently, if I'm rich, if I'm a hub in the circuit, if I'm a hub neuron, I tend to make, make many connections to another hub. It's called the rich club. So this is a hub, hub connected to a hub neuron, connected to a hub neuron. We found a lot of, this is what is expected if the, if the hubs are not connected to each other just randomly, and this is what happens when the hubs are more than expected by random to be connected, and there is a lot of rich clubness, rich club in this circuit. Anyway, you go, you go and analyze the circuit. I don't want to go any further, but as I said before, if you analyze the circuit, you find specific motifs that are overexpressed relative to random, and some other specific motifs, like motif number seven, that is underexpressed exactly as in the experiments. So this is, for example, a prediction that I didn't build in, I didn't plan when I built it, I didn't plan that this will be overexpressed and this will be underexpressed, or this will be underexpressed. I didn't plan it, it came out. And because it is so close to reality, we think maybe our circuit is close to reality. This was not planned in advance. Anyway, we need to also understand that. So let, let me summarize what we learned until now uh, from this 
thing, I will, I will say it more. I will, I, will, I, will, uh, I will discuss it a little bit further. I just want to say that we found in the circuit that we built non-random connectivity, absolutely non-random, and close to what we found experimentally. And one interesting thing that we found is what is called the small world connectivity. Small world means that there is a short, like in the Facebook, in friendship in the world, you know, that on average there is six, you have to go through six people until you meet somebody that you don't know at all. There is a distance of six friends between you and in the Facebook friendship. In the cortex, in this local circuit, there is on average a distance of 2.5 synapses between any two cells. You take any two cells and you ask how long the distance in terms of synapses between this cell and another cell, on average only 2.5. So it's very compressed circuit, it's very intimate circuit, it's a small world circuit. Let me tell you another thing about the petal motifs. That's something very surprising that, as I said, just submitted to nature. Hopefully they will accept it. I think it's a very unusual design. So this is Rodrigo Perrin from Henry. This is my student who does this graph analysis. And I want to ask a question. What is the origin of these over or under express motifs? So let's say that these three cells are connected. Why? In the circuit they are more connected than expected by random. I, I, I know that it's late, so I don't want to go into details, but I want to, to tell you the, the principle that now seems so reasonable, but I didn't think about this before building it, so that's a good reason to build, because you start to think about why there are these particular overexpressed. So, for example, I should tell you that one of the overexpressed motifs is when cell A is connected to cell B, and cell A is connected to cell uh, C, there is a very good chance that C will be connected to B. So this kind of triplet, in this particular direction, is overexpressed in the circuit. Much more than expected by random, but many hundreds of times more expected by random. Why? So we analyze it mathematically. I don't want to go into details now because of the, the time, but I want to tell you a very simple thing. Very simple thing. That because neurons are polar structures, they have direction, and dendrites in the cortex tend to go upward, and axons tend to go downward. I don't mean that the axon cannot go also upward, but on average, the dendrites tend to go upward, and the axon tend to go downward. The fact that the neuron is polar and not spherical, not completely isotropic, but inisotropic, there is a direction, this dictates, essentially, that if I'm above this one, there is a good chance that my axon will make connection to this one. And if I'm above this one, there is a good chance that I will make connection to this one. And if, if this one is above this one, there is a chance that this two will be a connection here. So that's the locate the fact that the axon and dendrites are polar, and the fact that there is location, I'm above you, you are above me, and I'm also above you, this dictates a global structure in your cortex. You cannot avoid this. Not when you build a circuit, not when there is a biological circuit. This must be overexpressed in your in your body. This is the new result, the new understanding of the emergence of global structure from local properties of neurons. So the fact that neurons are not spherical dictates the structure of the body. Of course, on top of it, there may be plasticity. You may give up connection of this cell and make connection to another cell below you to a third cell and below you, but the structure doesn't change, the global structure doesn't change, but identity, so I can give up this connection, but I go to him, because he's below me. Okay, this, this is our finding, this is a prediction, and then we went to Rodrigo, who is a, an extremely good, so I, I'm, 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 I'm jumping on all the mathematics of proving it, but just want to show you the result. By the way, because people are doing now work here on the cerebellum, there is a nice paper by, from, from, the, from the lab of, uh, of Michael Moisen, who looked at inhibitory cells in the, the cerebellum and, and measured four, four cells simultaneously. He found exactly the same overexpression and underexpression because this cell in the cerebellum as this cell in the cortex have direction. And because of this direction, it must impose motifs, triplets, quadruplets, five motifs. They must impose a structure. So for me, looking at neurons for many years, 
I didn't understand before that the fact that the neural network structure imposes a global structure on the network. This is something new that I didn't think about this. I'm hoping that the nature editors will also be excited that, as I am of this result. Anyway, so we went to we went to back to Perim, who as I said knows to record from 11 cells simultaneously. We now have something like 3,200 triplets from the experiment. It's a huge sample. 3,200 3, triplets. So this is an example that this said, now this is real, this is now a circuit, this is connected to this, this is connected to that. And really, you can see what the prediction of the blue brain, this is the blue brain prediction that these motifs will be overexpressed and this motif underexpressed and so on. And this is exactly happens also in the mouse brain. So this is really a prediction who should be above who to make this triplet, who should be below who when you don't have this triplet. So the location of the cell relative to another cell will dictate a triplet both in the cortex of a mouse or a rat, but also in the cortex of the blue brain. The same principle holds, just because you took the same cell and you put them in the space. They must have this triplet. So that's, a, that's an interesting result. And now we are working on trying to understand what is the meaning of this particular non-randomness of the cortex. So I told you that there is a short distance, small wall distance between a cell to a cell, on average two and a half synapses. There are these triplet motifs. There is rich club. There are these triplet motifs. There is rich club. There is a structure in your cortex. And the question, what does it do for you? Maybe it's just a bug. You cannot avoid it, but you don't use it. Maybe it's, it's used for memory, retaining memory, processing information through the cortex, that it's not random. We now know that you should be very careful not to have a disease that attack apps. And there are diseases that attack particular subset types and so on. So anyway, these are a set of predictions came from analyzing and building a circuit. And now you can really test it experimentally because optically you can silent this cell type or silent this type and see how does it affect the dynamics of the network now that you know which cell should be more effective or less effective and so on. So this is the first thing that I learned. When you really take seriously the volume and you really seriously take the shape of neuron and you put them in the correct location and density, you get an understanding that you would not get if you would not build it unless you are very clever and you can think of everything yourself. But the, the mere fact that I built something gave us really new insights about the local structure of the cortex. Not the global structure between the brain region, but the local structure of the cortex. So that's the first thing. This was just recently published in Nature Neuroscience, as I said, and you can look at it, but the, the, the next one about the motifs and the origin of brain motifs, this is in the process of reviewing. Okay, so I just want to say that there is a lot of interesting work that, uh, that was done on, 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 oh, it's not here. It was done on the meaning of, uh, so where is this? Yes, we know what is the meaning of hubs. There is a robustness and there is an impact there on, on local, local attack. What is the meaning of, of rich club? So there is a lot of theoretical work on the whole brain, but this is also related to this local brain. What is the meaning of a rich lab for information processing? What could motifs do for retaining memory? There are, by the way, genetic motifs. There is a very beautiful work from the White Sunday Institute about genetic motifs and what is the meaning of a motif, genetic motif, what is the meaning of small ones. So we are trying to analyze now, now that we know that we have half, we have motifs, we are trying to understand what does it mean for the processing of information in the cortex. Okay, I want to show you something else that we learned by using the theory. What I call the practical use of the theory. So I want to talk about the phenomena that all of you know, a surprise phenomena. So when I do to you like this, ta 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 ta, ta 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 ta, you will respond much more to the surprise, so to speak, to the deviant, than to the regular one. And this is a classical experiment, very classical experiment that was done many, many years by all these papers, many, many tens of papers summarizing this work of this, what is called the stimulus-specific adaptation in your auditory cortex, like, like this experiment. So you do ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta, ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta. 
and you, and you recall from the auditory brain, from the auditory cortex, and you see that the response of the cells to the deviant, no matter if the deviant is below the, the regular, so it could be ta 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 doesn't matter who is the deviant, it could be above you, it could be below you, as long as it is rare, this is rare relative to this, let's say 5% of the cases are rare, 5% of the cases are rare, if you recall from the brain of a mouse, auditory cortex of the mouse, you see that the response to the rare, to the rare stimulus, physiologically, the response is much stronger on average than to the, to the standard. So this is the response to the rare, to the rare. This is also the response to the rare. And again, no matter if the rare is above the standard or below the standard, as long as it is rare. This is why you respond to surprise. You get used to the standard, ta, 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 ta. You respond to the rare. Surprise. What is the mechanism of surprise in your brain? Why are you surprised? So, the idea, many, many years, so, something like uh, more than 10 years now, the idea is that this is the result, mechanistically, the result of what is called synaptic depression. When you activate the cell again and again and again and again with the same input, the postsynaptic cell, the synapse between the two, become depressed, and the response of the postsynaptic cell will be depressed, and on average the circuit will be depressed, and you will get a lower response on average after enough time of time, 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 time. When you do something new, another input comes, this particular synapse is not tired, is not depressed, there will be a higher response. So the people thought that depression, synaptic depression, explains the phenomena of stimulus-specific adaptation, SSA, or what they call a surprise response. That's, that's, that's the belief. When you have a belief like this, you can build the circuit, you can build the model, because you think that this is the result, this is the solution. You build the model, a simple circuit with synaptic depression, and you activate the input, and indeed the circuit behaves as expected, you are very happy because you build a model that fits the results. But does the brain work like this? Maybe, maybe it has another mechanism. So this is what we did. We built, we took the circuit, that I told you about, the blueprint circuit, as it is. We didn't change any parameter. As it is. And we said, let's, let's call it a court, an auditory circuit. Let's, let's say that this is an auditory circuit, a column, auditory column. You know that in the auditory circuit there is a tonotopic mapping. You know that these high frequencies, let's say, are, are mapped here. This is a mapping of the tonotopic, the response to tones, let's say, in this this volume in this column, so this is this is this frequency and this response to another frequency, and we, we just simulate this by doing the following. We just added to the circuit, we add the thalamus. The thalamus gives input to the cortex. So this is let's say the thalamus, these are axons from the thalamus, and they project into the cortex in the model. So let's say that this is the thal the auditory thalamus. And these are axons that respond to this frequency. They climb here and they make connections here. This is, by the way, built on the anatomy of thalamical, thalamical cortical axons. This is a connection from this axon. This axon that, is, that responds to this 32K hertz goes upward. But of course, the axon is not a wire. It spreads a little bit. So this is, this is in the model what a local axon from the thalamus converge into the cortex. You know that most of the connections are to layer 4, but also to layer 2, 3, and so on. We have 560 axons climbing from the thalamus into the cortex, and each axon responds differently to tone, according to the experimental results. So we didn't change anything, but we added into the circuit a tone, a set of tones. So this becomes now auditory circuit, this becomes thalamic auditory thalamus, and there is a connection between them. And we just take the circuit and we put tones, as in the experiment. We did exactly the same experiments that they do with a, with a mouse, but in this case, the experiment is in the computer. Okay, so all you, you already know the experiment. You put different frequency, ta 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 into the into the model. Now it's into the model. 
So this is the this is the, the standard. This is the deviant, or this could be the standard. But this is the deviant. Exactly the same experiment that was done with the animal, and we got exactly the same results that was found in the experiment, without any parameter tuning. We didn't tune anything. We just took the theory. You can see that there is a bigger response to the deviant relative to the standard. No matter if it's F1 versus F2 or F2 versus F1, you always see a strong response to the deviant, a surprise. So the computer circuit is also surprised, the, the, the circuit is also surprised by the change in the, in the frequency, by the deviant. What is the mechanism? Now I can ask because I have the circuit, I can ask the mechanism. I can simulate the mechanism. Okay. So we have a measure for the surprise. If it was zero, there was no difference between F1 and F2. If it's above zero, this means a surprise. You can see that this layer five and the layer four, five, and so on are more surprised than other layers as in the experiments. But anyway, this is a measure for how much F1 response is different than F2 response, and vice versa. So now you can do the following. I can now block depression. In our model, there is enough depression, but I can block depression. Something I cannot do experimentally. There is no way that I can block the synapse and make it not depressed. There is no, I, we don't know how to make the synapse fixed, that it won't depress with time. Because biological synapse depress with time, and we have depression in our model. But now I can block the depression mathematically. So we block the depression. No depression anymore in the circuit. Still, there is surprise. So it's not the depression. It's wonderful that the models can replicate the depression through it, but it's not the depression that does it in this model. Partially, yes, there is a difference between this and this, but I block all synaptic depression. All the synapses are fixed in their size. They don't depress, they don't facilitate, they are fixed. Still, you get a surprise. So why? Now I can start to study the circuit. And then indeed, without going into details, we found a mechanism, an addition mechanism, which calls spike frequency adaptation. There is a property of cells that the spikes themselves become adapted. So if you give a steady pulse, the spikes are ta, 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 ta. It's called spike frequency adaptation. This is a mechanism of the spike, not of the signals. And apparently, if you block spike frequency adaptation on top of or blocking depression, so you block depression, still surprise. You block spike frequency adaptation, which is shown here, you kill the surprise. So at least two mechanisms are responsible for this. And this spike frequency adaptation actually is a stronger mechanism. And that's beautiful that your brain keep being surprised even if your synapses become stable and not depressed because there is an additional mechanism. Actually, there are other mechanisms in the circuit. The circuit, your surprise is not built on one mechanism. But now, because we have a circuit, I can really explore the mechanism assuming that the circuit is circuit replicated biology. So that's an advantage of building a circuit. Now you really can ask directly questions, and there are predictions. We know that this is what is called the A current, the current that makes the, synapse, the spikes uh, adapt. Now we can block and now people are starting, because of this work, people are starting to do new experiments, starting to block this particular property, making the spikes regular, and see if the spike frequency adaptation or the surprise is indeed gone. So this is an experiment, prediction for experimentalists, and they did not think about this before. So the model really helps them. And, and that's how I see this, 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 uh, this work. I think our model really, the, 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 the existence of a model, the existence of, uh, of such a model is, is a very important tool for the experimentalist who puts an electrode in the brain and get a very sparse sampling, he gets a behavior, and then he builds a model. The model could be right, the model could be wrong, it doesn't have a way to directly assess it. If you have a replica, one by one, hopefully, you can use the replica because you can control each parameter individually, you can really test and predict future experiments. So I can see a ping pong between the circuit you build and the biology. So I should tell the girl at the age of 11 that the, the, the fact that I build a replica helps me to understand back the, the, the biology. It's not an independent thing. There is a ping pong between the two. 
And I also want to understand that, for example, nobody understands what EMG is. You know, physicians use EMG all the time. But nobody understands the origin of EMG. What is the source of EMG in the brain? Is it layer 4? Is it layer 5? Is it a combination of them? Is it deeper structure? Who is responsible for ta 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 in your brain? You can use it as a tool, of course. You can see epileptic seizure, but you don't understand the origin of the, of the phenomenon. Now we have a theory. Actually, we just completed, you should know, we just completed the whole mouse brain, the whole mouse cortex, which is 10 million cells. We have a model of the whole cortex of the mouse. The next thing we should build the skull, a model of the skull. We'll put an electrode, EEG electrode, in the model. We'll activate the cortex, and then we should analyze the signals and we'll better understand why does it go up here, sync, source, source, sync, sync, like that. Who is the origin of the circuit? It rise to this. So that's an advantage. So I learned something about the origin of the structure of the cortex, and I learned something about the physiology of the cortex from the circuit. I want to end by the future it is in our life. You know that we are in the middle of revolution of machine learning. Everybody knows that we are in the age of an amazing revolution. I don't know if everybody understands what a huge, I think it's the biggest revolution ever human did, much more than industrial or information revolution. The fact that machines can learn independently and become individuals. So I want to say one thing about machine learning, deep, deep network as it is called, because I want to show you that neurons are already deep themselves. That the individual neuron is already deep. It's not one layer. The neuron itself is deep. I want to show you a little work on that very fast. I want to say a word about human neurons that, uh, that, that, uh, that the GDO mentioned. And maybe I just want to say something about learning. But I want to mention uh, the fact that you know, you know very well that if I want to teach a machine to identify a cup, or this a cup, another cup, and so on, I have to give a lot of examples to the network. And today, because I have a lot of examples, because I have big data in my uh, computers, I have many, 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 many millions of cups that were annotated. Okay, million of, of, of examples. We think, by the way, that the child at the age of two sees something like many million examples of a face. You know, this is a face, this is a face, this is a face, this is a face. Many examples of the same face of the mother, of the father, of the friend. Anyway, eventually you learn. You learn by many examples as a child, but you can also learn by many examples as a deep network. So you give an input to the input layer, a cup, a cup, a cup, a cup. You change the weights of the synapses until the output is one for a cup and zero for everything else. So this is now a network that learns to respond to cars. Okay? And all these automated cars just sold in Israel for, for 12 billion dollars to mobile I sold to, uh, to Intel for 12 million to have an automated car. It's a professor, my friend professor of mine who became a billionaire in a day. Deep networks. But you see that these deep networks of four are built on these neurons, so to speak, a point neuron, a node that sum up the synaptic input and generate an output if it crosses a certain threshold. But is our brain built like this? First of all, clearly not, because this is a feed-forward network. And you know, all know well that our brain is a recovery. You know also that there are inhibitory synapses in the brain. These are all excitatory synapses. So it's, it's not a replica of the brain, but it's still inspired by the brain. This is interesting. It's very successful, as you know, because in the last few years, the rate of errors became lower and lower in this deep network, artificial deep network, they are performing extremely well. Actually, some, some of them perform better than us in face recognition and so on. It's wonderful, it's very successful, and when I talk to these people in machine learning, that I'm telling you, the brain doesn't work like this. The brain has feed forward and feed backward, and the recurrent inputs, and there is inhibition, there is irritation, and nerve cells are not this. They said, okay, but we don't care about the brain, we want to be the machine. But I care about the brain, so I want to understand how the brain does it, not how machine does it. Still, it's a very interesting, uh, 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 inspiring success. By the way, I should tell you something interesting. If you ask the theoretician, why, why 
Suddenly, when you build many, many deep networks, hundreds of layers, it became so successful in this pattern recognition. Why a shallow network of three or four layers do not do it? Why? There is no theoretical understanding of that yet. It's interesting that you build a machine that succeeds to do something, but you don't still understand the principle. Why does it end up do so well? It was a trial and error. There are companies that make many hundred billion, millions, becoming very rich, you know, deep mine in London, and Google and all that, but that there is no real understanding, which is worrisome because you build a network which you build and, and it learns and it changes and eventually performs so well, you don't understand it. If you don't understand what you build, how will you understand the brain? It's an issue, yes? But anyway, it, it's a great success and a big revolution. We are going to see robots soon that will behave independently, take care of the elderly, drive buses. I think within 20, 30 years, people will be amazed if somebody drives buses. Like, like 30 years ago, somebody drove elevator. There was somebody pushing the elevator. It's quite amazing. It will be the same for bus drivers. Because of this machine learning, it's a revolution. So I have a very talented student whose task was to take a neuron, a model of a neuron, nonlinear model of a neuron, with NMDA spikes and calcium spikes and nonlinear synapses, a real simulated neuron, and ask a very simple question. I have an input to this neuron, a large space of synaptic input bombarding this neuron. I have large space of output to this neuron. How deep should I build a network in order to replicate the input-output properties of this pyramidal neuron? Could I replicate it with a point neuron? Or should I have many layers in order to replicate all the input-output properties of these neuron models of a neuron using Python neuron? Then I replicate it with one or two layers. Eventually, this is another paper that we just sent to Nature. We are sending papers to Nature. Who knows? Uh, you need seven layers, seven depths of seven layers to replicate the input output of the individual pyramid of neurons. This means that your brain, you know that there are not so many synapses from your input to the eye until I move my head. There are no hundreds of layers. Ah, maybe ten. Thalamus, cortex, several cortex layers, motor cortex, output. We think that the neuron itself is a deep layer. The neuron itself is seven layers at least. Multiply by the number of chain synapses, this will make your brain deep. So that's one direction we are going. And eventually we want to take a Purkinje cell. We want to ask how deep is the Purkinje cell from the input to the Purkinje cell until the output of the axon of the Purkinje cell, how deep it is. So we are analyzing now different cell types, how deep they are, <laughs> inhibitory cells, and so forth. And the next thing is, what is the, what is the fun, how, how can, can a single cell do image processing? A single cell, because it's already seven layers deep, or ten layers deep, what kind of information processing unit it is? If you take a face and you want to analyze it, get an output, a cleaner output, could an individual cell can do it. So this is the first time and I'm really proud of it because I'm thinking about neurons, you know, I'm dreaming about neurons for 30 years, but I never had a way to compare the complexity, the computational power of this cell type versus this cell type versus this cell type. I didn't have a measure of complexity. Now I have a direct measure. I say layer 5 pyramidal cell is 7 layer deep, Kinchi said, because of these nonlinearities and calcium spikes and all that, is 10 layers deep, inhibitory cells smaller, maybe five layers deep. Who is smarter? Who is smarter? Which microchip is smarter? This microchip is smarter than the other microchip because I have now a measure of depth. That's a new approach. <coughs> Finally, we want to look at human cells. We want to compare mouse cells to human neurons in terms of complexity. And you may know, this is a very special thing that you all should know me, that the world is going a little bit further beyond the mouse and is working also on human cells because in each hospital, including in Pavia, I said it correct, Pavia, in the hospital they do brain operation. They take parts of the cortex, as in this case, 
There was a big, a, a deep tumor here. This is done in Amsterdam, in the in the a free university hospital in Amsterdam. Like in any other hospital, there was a, a tumor here, and they had to take out the cortex in order to get to the tumor. This is done in every hospital, and the, and the tissue is thrown to the garbage. What can I do with the tissue? But you can do with the tissue. You can do electrophysiology and anatomy with the tissue. Just to show you that if you take a human tissue after operation, this is the size of the piece that was taken out here, compared to the same scale to the size of the mouse brain. You can see that in the hospital, the piece that they take and throw to the garbage, hopefully it's a healthy tissue. Of course, if you're sitting here and there was a tumor or epileptic seizure here, so it may be not completely uh, healthy, this has to be assessed. But anyway, the pieces of the tissue that exists in hospitals from human is huge. And you can do experiments, you can take a slice, you can stain a cell with biocytin or something else, you can reconstruct a cell, you can do what they do in Madrid. This is dead tissue post-mortem, you can really count the number of spines and synapses in human cells, pyramidal cells. This is Javier de Felipe, and we are starting to have human cells back. A bank of human cells. There is now close overall all over the world, from Allen Institute, who has a whole unit working with that. Ed Lane is the head of the unit in Allen Institute. There is in Amsterdam, we have now in Jerusalem, and more and more groups start to participate under the Human Brain Project, including from different regions, hippocampus, human cells, pyramidal cells in the cortex, inhibitory cells and so forth, we are starting to have a large data set and we can now analyze, so recently we have a paper showing that analyzing the morphology of human cells, layer 2, 3 human cells, there are actually two types, so we develop a new technique to compare morphologies and say that this morphology is different than this, it's not just a stretch and so on. So just to let you know that there is a new world project the world project to use the tissue from hospitals to learn something about the human brain. Also to learn about pharmacology. You may know that there are things, you know, there are medicine that was developed for the mouse do not work on humans. So there are differences in receptors, membrane receptors, synapses, we don't know why. Sometimes it works here and doesn't work there. And so we now have a tissue that can directly, can directly test pharmaceutical pharmacology on the tissue real time on the left. So this is, I think, a, a very exciting new direction that human who wants to understand themselves eventually. All of us came in order to understand ourselves, not only the mouse, also the mouse, but also ourselves. So we are really starting to analyze morphologies of human neurons. I can tell you that pyramidal humans, or pyramidal cells of humans, are more sophisticated, are more branched, especially in the basal tree. There are more nonlinear subunits in human neurons versus the mouse. So it's not just a stretched version. You cannot take a mouse pyramidal cell and stretch it, multiply it by two. It's not the same tree. And this implies that it has much more depth into the computation, and that's what exactly what we analyze now. I can show you that there are much more local nonlinearities in human cells. The number of nonlinear subunits in human are larger. And this is another paper that was just published. So this is the second direction. How these are neurons, what is unique about human neurons, and the third and the final thing that we are doing, for some of you are interested in robotics and learning, we are trying to take the circuit that was reconstructed. This is a blue brain circuit of a cubic millimeter. We can activate the whole circuit in the computer and get dynamics. This is a dynamical circuit, this is an anatomical circuit, but we can also do plasticity in the circuit. We can also teach the circuit to do something, as a GDO and his group are doing in terms of robotics. In this case, by the way, this is an extremely talented fellow that you should all know, Italian, you should be proud of him. He works with Henry Marcra, and he's an expert in, in plasticity. But he has a much more sophisticated plastic models of synapses compared, let's say, to head or STDP, spike time independent uh, uh, spike time independent plasticity, plasticity rule, but much more sophisticated based on biophysics. And, 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 and with Giuseppe and two of my students, we are now putting plasticity into the blue brain cell. While it is active, the synapses are changing. 
It's not a static theory. It's dynamical theory in terms of plasticity. And this enables us to use the circuit in a closed loop in order to drive a virtual car. You can teach the blueprint circuit to drive a car to avoid obstacles, for example. But this needs, again, plasticity of synapses in order for the motor output to affect the sensory input, which means changing the efficacy of synapses. I want to end by saying the following, <coughs> again for you. I think this is a wonderful project. I'm very proud of this because I think what we do now will affect the next generation tremendously. They really should be prepared. And these kids get in the internet a lot of bullshit. This says this, and this rabbi said that, and this priest said that, and this guru said this. They don't know anymore what is true and what is fake. It's our duty, our, our duty scientists, to tell what we do in a factual, concrete, clear way to kids. So this is the idea of this journal. I told you that the kids are the reviewers. And I actually just got a big donation in Hebrew to make this journal, which started the, the, in the frontiers, to, to make these journals in Hebrew. Because you have to switch in Hebrew, it's, you know, right, left, left, right, and the whole platform changes, and the kids should log in with the cell phone and, and read the papers. And of course, it has to be translated. So it is now in Hebrew. There are 300 papers in English. There are 2 million English children looking at the, at the journal every day. Two million children with our papers every day. We want it in the Hebrew, but I also want it in Italian, in Arabic, in Chinese. So if you have a small donor, let tell me because we need somebody to translate it from English to Italian and help to transform the platform. But I call you to contribute the paper, to contribute the child, the kid, the family, to be a reviewer, but also to translate the papers into English and into Italian. Thank you very much. Hi, I think we have no words because this is one of the most interesting and fascinating presentations that I ever heard. And also there are a couple of messages that I would like really to take very seriously. The last one, I mean, I forgot to tell that about the many things, the among the many things that Dan is doing, he is one of the founders and one of the directors of Frontiers, which is the most important open access journal of the world. And I am the fortune of being the editor of Frontiers with him. And uh, I started quite soon in interacting with this incredible group, but he done a bit more. He found it, had the idea to found it. And also that story would be more mainstream that nobody had the time to tell it, but it's an interesting story itself. So Frontiers started from almost nothing. It didn't exist, it was an idea. Now it's one of the most important journals of the world. It started in a swimming pool in Brazil. <laughs> we took some wines and it happened. He said, let's have a new journal open access to the public 10 years later. It's the biggest exactly. journal in the world. So this is the first message I take very seriously. I will surely work in order to have this translation in time. And then we'll come kids. back to it very quickly. Okay. The other message I take very seriously is the Porkinji cell that was shown here where we have, thanks to our younger colleagues, one of the best authors ever. And we have really to go through this uh, theoretical analysis of the computer and the computer. So we will surely consider immediately. And the other message is that in this car, driven a court even column will be crashed somewhere because it lacks the server value. So you absolutely need to connect the piece of server value. That's the other I agree. take very seriously. Absolutely. absolutely. You need some prediction. You have we to need have a prediction. Yeah, and Sir Bello is good in predicting what should come next, and then we don't have it here. That's the predictive imperative of brain structure. So that's an imperative. Without prediction, the brain is not there. So, and I'm, 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 I'll stop speaking here. If you have answers, questions, and then. Uh, Please, yes.
at 10 o'clock, 30, maybe you are tired, but if you have a question, <laughs> if you do have a question, this is a unique opportunity. Although you can always email me, but please ask if you feel something that is missing or bothering. In Israel, they will attack me with many questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Giovanni, Giovanni is your colleague, he's a mathematician. I mean, we did the first model, the first model in neuron done in Italy. It was done with him in 2001. They put it on the journal Neuroscience. Okay. It was a real breakthrough because it was the first model after Hodgkin and Axel and Connors and Stevens mm -hmm. describing a full neuron, a full neuron with um, Hodgkin actually models of uh, ionic channels and conductances in the membrane. All the neuron, all the parameters were taken from experiments. It remains an incredible example, and uh, Giovanni did it. Yeah. So, thank you a lot because I have a lot of things to be involved. <laughs> thank you. But uh, the first one is that there are a lot of feedback in the series because, uh, because uh, you mean the learning circuit, the, the one that learned the new drive, so to speak? The second one is about, in the first part, we show that uh, there is a short path in our brain between, uh, for, for, the, for the signal. And uh, I can imagine that uh, your uh, big <laughs> design is that we have a small board of networks. I mean, we have a small network from deep networks. Yes, for energy. En energy. The cost is less in our brain by using a network network, mm -hmm. which the network is a neon network, instead of have a deep network, deep, uh, deep network is in the engineer because uh, they have a lot of steps, a lot of state, a lot of energy, a lot of time for the senior in order to I, I'm not dealing with energy, but this is a key point. You know that the brain is extremely efficient energetically. You know, I'm using 20 watts. We are using 20 watts, so I eat a little steak or chocolate, and I can do all this functioning with 100, 100 billion processors. My computer takes, with one processor, more energy. So the energetic aspect of the brain is miraculous, how efficient we are. It's not my field, so I know that uh, GTO is, is working a little bit about energetic and blood. Blood, and blood vessels and, and neurons. But, but, but one thing I should tell you, and, and I, I didn't mention it, when, when we build a deep network of a neuron, there is the input layer, which is the synaptic input layer. The other layers, unlike in the deep network, every layer has synapses. This neuron is a unique deep network because the synapses only come at the input layer. The other layers are without synapses unlike in the deep network, classical deep network, and there is an output at the axon. So it's a different architecture. It's not the same architecture. And, and the question, which we don't know, we are now working, if I would build a deep network where each node is a deep network itself, but each node is a deep network as a neuron with an input layer, output layer, and no synapses in between, will it save us computational time relative to the a classical deep network, we don't know yet because we didn't build a network out of the neural networks as yet, but that's a direction. <coughs> Will it be more efficient energetically, so to speak, in the computer? I don't know yet, but one thing I, 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 you're right and we don't understand how come that the brain is so successful in doing so many computations so cheaply energetically. It's a huge, important question. I don't know if you know, but our blue brain machine, which is in Lugano, has a hundred thousand processors, it costs a million dollars every year to cool down. It's so expensive. It's like a little city that you need to cool down. And we cannot continue working with these computers anymore if we want to simulate a whole mouse brain, not to speak about human brain. There is a problem of energy. So we are stuck there and we need another understanding of how does the brain does it so cheaply and build computers inspired by the cheapness of the brain in, this, in the sense of energy. But you wanted to ask a question. Yeah, uh, so basically, uh, as far as I remember, the networks, the concept in Europe, uh, was discovered around 20 or 15 years ago in the uh, early stage of that. And what was discovered? What? Uh, new networks principles, uh, like the ability of uh, human um, uh, learning system in the machines. Um, I would say that human-based thinking in machines because 
uh, we work, uh, he, uh, he, was, uh, he was good then tried to replicate uh, how they think on machines. He tried to build something more efficient on what was already discovered and say by the So uh, I want to know uh, your opinion on whether that's on top that's the, uh, like the best way you can uh, see discover the world, learn about the world, how you can bring works to the things that you know, the, the general, you know, the general public is very worried from what we do. You should be aware of it because you know they are really afraid that eventually we should build machines that will replace us. You know, the old Frankenstein worry that it will be a machine that is, you know, without emotion and they are better than us and we, we are useless anymore. So in, in some sense, uh, I should tell my opinion, of course, and it, I talk a lot about this, it's not my field, machine learning, but I talk a lot about these people that I mentioned that sold, the, you know, they are very experts in that. So, so these machines are very specific machines. They know to do one thing. They know to detect red light, crossroad. They are very good in this. If you teach them enough, they become experts, so to speak, in, 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 in analyzing cluster, you know, cluster analysis, but they don't know so they are very good in vision, let's say, but they are not very good in intelligence, decision making. In that sense, we are much more sophisticated as humans. We have intelligence of different types, emotional intelligence, social intelligence, movement intelligence, all that I do now, we are very far from having robots. So in that sense, I always tell the people that are worried that we are very far, very far from, so to speak, competing with this complicated machine. I'm not saying that I'm not a machine, but we certainly are far from understanding basic principles and especially the integration of different facets to make me human. And, and, and the other thing I want to say that this bottom-up that we are doing and we are discussing with the GDO a lot today, and not only today, this bottom-up approach is limited in the sense that, you know, it can give you understanding of diseases or the phenomena like surprises mechanistically. But you still need a top-down approach and a psychophysical approach to look at the machine, so to speak, behaving, try to characterize principles of behavior, and then look at it top down, high level theories, like physicists are doing. And we are trying also in the Human Brain Project to connect these levels. So one is building top down to a certain level, but of course I cannot only expand any intelligence from my machine. I cannot. I can replicate experiments, but I don't understand high level phenomena. We need theoreticians coming top down. We should meet someone with this approach. We didn't meet yet, although it's starting, people are becoming more open to the other direction. Uh, even in the Human Brain Project, the physicists are strong-headed, they want high-level theories, we want bottom-up, but eventually we shall meet. I think a connection of these approaches, so this is not the only approach and not enough. We shall never understand the brain, never understand the brain, bottom-up. You see, I can build something that will behave, but they will not understand it. As I don't understand the machine, I build it, deep learning. So I need some higher level understanding. And that's what physicists, theoreticians should come to the field. And the connection will bring us understanding in a deeper sense. At least that's how I see it. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a great point, And this is one of the most critical philosophical uh, discussions that we can have on this issue. So the contact between the top down and the bottom up is really critical. And also, there is an ontological issue and we don't know exactly how to make this matching. So we're trying to develop the instruments, the tools to make the matching. Because ourselves have difficulties in finding the way to match the two approaches. We're beginning to devise a, some, a way out. Yes? Real subjective 
person, the person itself, the person. The person is missing. The person is missing. I understand exactly what you say, and I don't know much about how to, how to respond to this. First of all, of course, there are individual differences. You know that one person behaves differently to the same operation or to the same education. We don't understand these local differences in sciences. It's really far, unfortunately, from the understanding individuality. We take an average. I'm saying a brain. I didn't say whose brain. Is it your brain? Is it my brain? Is it his brain? We say brain. So science is at the stage of doing average. We speak about the general phenomena, hoping that my Parkinson and your Parkinson and his Parkinson is similar. But it's not the same. It's not the same. We should have to come to a personalized medicine or personalized operation. Hopefully, we should avoid operation and we should understand better a priori with sensory input. So if you ask me what is the future, so to speak, I was actually interviewed recently. I had a very special, fortunate occasion. I didn't have time to tell even to Egidio, my friend. I was invited to the Allen Institute because the Allen Institute, Paul Allen just died, but he gave a lot of money both in the past and also in the future. Actually, a billion dollar every 10 years to Allen Institute to have a project. And we discussed what should be the project for the next 10 years. What should be the project? There was a big debate, you know, a billion dollars is not small money, and what should be the big brain project? I myself, I didn't succeed, I told them take one neuron, one disease, let's say Parkinson, and solve it. Do a V. One disease, because you know, we didn't solve any one brain disease. There are 560 known brain diseases with names. There is no solution to either one of them. There are, you know, you can moderate it, help a little bit, operate on it, but solution, we don't have a solution to any one of the brain diseases. We did solve other diseases, you know. We can take antibiotics and we solve diseases, but not brain diseases. So I told them, take something and after 10 years, say, I finished Parkinson. There is no Parkinson anymore. They didn't take it. Maybe they are right, because it's, it's so difficult to solve a brain disease. It's so complicated and intricate. There are many parameters that brings Parkinson, and many parameters that brings autism. It's not, not one thing. It's not easy to... But I think we should go there, because we are becoming old, you know, we are aging, and we enable ourselves to go older, and there will be more and more of these diseases. Dementia, Alzheimer. I think we need to attack it. But I think this kind of an approach, when you ask what happens in Parkinson in the circuit, when does a circuit become Parkinsonian? What are the parameters that make a circuit Parkinsonian or epileptic? We are starting to understand much better through this bottom-up approach. So I'm hopeful that at least we should understand the mechanism of Parkinson. How to treat Parkinson is, is another issue, but at least we need the understanding of the mechanism in order to treat the mechanism. So in that sense, I'm hopeful. Other curiosities, questions? I understand it's late, but I think the occasion is really uh, um, incredibly uh, unique. So if you have any question, please come on. If not, I'm here. One, I'm one, one. Thierry. So, and one thing we learned something about these experiments in basically neurons and the speech neurons. So, how do you? Wonderful question. So I'll uh, so tell you what we did. We take, we took all the nonlinearities from the membrane of the of the modern neuron. So we take a pyramidal cell with all the complexity of the morphology, but with linear membrane, passive membrane, RC membrane, no nonlinear channels in the dendrite, only spiking in the axon. We bombarded the same structure, but now passive structure with the same number of inputs, and we got the output. And we found that for this particular passive dendritic structure, we need only one hidden layer to replicate its input output. So my answer to you is that all the complexity that requires seven layers, or maybe ten layers in the Pukinji cell, comes from dendritic nonlinearities. 
from the local degradative nonlinearity here, there is an NMDA nonlinearity here, there is Pax nonlinearity or combination of them. This makes the neuron behave deep. It's not the structure, it's the combination of structure and on top of it, nonlinearity. That's a very good point also because I link it to another issue that to build up large scale networks we needed to simplify the neurons to some extent. So one critical test could be to see whether a simplified neuron requires as many layers as a complex neuron in order to generate the output. If a neuron that is simplified, let's say, I mean, let's make an example, the Purkinje neuron that has been mentioned has about 65,000 differential equations in the model. Yeah. It's a huge number. You can build up the Paris State Building. You can't use it and extend it into a network of 35 million neurons, like the brain of the, the cerebellum of a mouse. We can't. Uh, but we can simplify the neuron. Then the point is how much of this computational power is maintained into the simplified form. So then, if the number of layers that are needed to generate the complexity of the output is more or less the same, then we've done a good job. Otherwise, no, we've lost a lot. So that, I think, is a critical test that could be used. But I should tell you something. That's a very good point. And if Gideon is correct that when you want to simulate the whole circuit, let's say 100,000 cells, and each cell is complicated and requires a lot of computation, we are getting stuck with the supercomputer. We cannot replicate a bigger brain, so even a circuit. But now, that's something I didn't mention. Now that I have a replica, an analog, of a single cell with all these differential equations, with a deep network, and the input-output of the differential equation complexity is the same as in the deep network, and the deep network is extremely faster, much faster, thousand times faster to compute when you have a replica. So now, actually, what we want to do with the blue brain is to replicate in each neuron through with, deep with, a, with a deep network. And that's it, a great it's idea. Like this to compute. That's a great idea. And that's the idea too. And Felix is coming to Israel exactly to learn how to replicate each cell with deep network, and it will take much, much, much faster, and exactly the same output will come because... Yeah, yeah, there's equivalence. Yeah, that, that's, there's an equivalence. That, that's a direction. That's incredibly nice. I think so. That's a new direction. New direction. You, you can ask me a question on the outside, so it will be less, yeah. less, less... Okay, more. so it's time probably to finish, and uh, so thank you very much, Dan, again. And that was really a uh, wonderful and unique occasion to have you here. And I hope we will replicate and we continue. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much.